Okay, this is the introduction to the federal courts. I'm going to look at the types of law that the federal courts uh, deal with and uh, what just what are the federal courts and then the men and women who populate the federal courts and, and under the titles of judges and things like that. All right, there are four types of law. Statutory, common, criminal, and civil. So let's look at... Uh, Let's look at these one at a time, and easily we can see that statutory law is pretty easy to figure out. It simply deals with laws that are written, that are in the books. So we call that statutory law. You have probably heard the term statutory rape. Well, when a woman is violated in that way, it's a violation of the law. Therefore, it is um, a chargeable offense. Now, common law is based upon a system of unwritten law, and those unwritten laws are based upon what's known as precedent, which means it's happened, what's happened in the past. So judges rely upon what's known as star decisis, let the decision stand. This is the basic system of law in Britain, and certainly we've adopted major, major portions of this uh, and let it evolve for the last 230 some odd years that the Constitution has been in effect here in the United States. Um, the third type is criminal. Now, criminal law concerns the violations of the criminal code, and so therefore it can be termed one, uh, one's actions uh, violation against society, and therefore you can be arrested for that. Now, the fourth type would be civil. Now, civil law concerns disputes between two parties rather than uh, any sort of violation versus society. So this can mean a breach of contract, slander, medical malpractice, etc. You see these types of cases in Judge, Ju in Judge Judy's show in the People's Court and others. Now, when a case is before the docket, judges can issue at least some preliminary actions. One of them can be called a writ of mandamus, which simply says it's a court order. <coughs> for one party to perform um, a certain act. Uh, an injunction is just the opposite. It prohibits uh, a party from performing a certain act. So, for instance, you own a large tract of land, you're, you're trying to grade it for building houses, you find that there are some very valuable oak trees on the property that um, an environmental group has now brought suit against your company to keep them from being cut down or removed. And so a judge will order an injunction uh, to keep you from doing that until you can resolve uh, the issue. <clears throat> and then civil law uh, has a new wrinkle, and we call this class action. Now, class action suits have been around since the 1970s. Uh, it involves a suit brought by a group of people who share a common grievance. You see them advertised on television all the time, uh, mesothelioma, uh, asbestos. Uh, hip replacement, knee replacement, uh, fin fin. All those things uh, are uh, um, considered grievable, and and so much so that there are certain venues that which actually make it easy to f to file uh, uh, class action lawsuits um, because they want the business uh, done in their venue. So many of these class action suits are actually shopped by uh, by attorneys. Now, when we look at judicial power, we have to say that judicial power is passive. The courts cannot reach out and grab a case. They have to wait for the case to come to them. And uh, the Supreme Court will even, when the case comes to them, will try to sidestep uh, an issue. Uh, but most of the time, the cases winding their way through the courts and winding, the, winding up on the court's uh, doorstep um, have taken two, three, four, five years to get there. <coughs> so the cases must come out to them. The judicial, pa judicial power is not aggressive. It's, it's entirely passive. Now, only those with standing may challenge a law or government action. So if your friend was hurt, you can't sue on their behalf. They have to initiate the action. Uh, the gentleman who sued on behalf of his daughter, complaining that she should not be forced to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, 
um, ran his case all the way to the Supreme Court and actually presented the case before the, ju the justices. He's not a practicing attorney, but he has a law degree. He has, he's more of a practicing doctor. And it was interesting in that the court decided that they could not rule on the case because they felt the girl's father did not have standing. Uh, and in essence, standing is very narrow. He didn't have standing because he was no longer married to the girl's mother and the girl had custody. So therefore, in the court's view, only the mother had standing in this case. So now he's trying it again. He's found two families in San Jose who uh, have agreed to be represented by him, and this case is winding its way through the courts again. And again, it, it will t take a while. Now, judges <coughs> are contrary to what some may think. Um, not simply impartial referees who only carry out the law. Judges also interpret the law, and they make law when they interpret the law. Um, and so some of them might find it necessary to make law because if we look at the first box, statutes are often broadly worded slash unclear slash contradictory. Again, bad bills coming out of Congress already, already, Obamacare has had to, had, had to face a Supreme Court case. Others are coming. Why? Because it's so badly written. Uh, secondly, the Constitution is broadly worded and requires interpretation. That's true. Uh, look at the, uh, the brouhaha uh, since 1789 over the Second Amendment. Uh, the third is the interpretation of statutes uh, and the Constitution, when the first two are considered, is simply, in effect, making law. So judges have that ability uh, to, do, to do just that. Now, <coughs> when we look at the history of the judiciary system, the courts have ruled about a thousand cases to, uh, over state laws as being unconstitutional. They've ruled about a thousand federal laws as being unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has re reversed itself more than 200 times since 1810. The most famous case, of, of course, of that happening is, is Brown v. Board of Education reversing Plessy v. Ferguson and ending separate but equal. Um, the courts have increasingly been willing to, to rule on political questions. This started in 1962 with Baker v. Carr when the court said, wait a minute, states cannot design districts which give um, certain voters, in this case rural, vote, rural voters, um, give their vote much more weight than a person living in urban areas. Uh, the court said that anybody who lives in a state, their vote must be correspondingly uh, the same as the person standing next to them. So all districts have to be drawn to have the same or almost the same population uh, as any other district within that state. Westbury v. Sanders, which followed two years later, said this not only pertains to state legislative districts, this now pertains to um, congressional districts. Now in Shaw v. Reno in the 1990s, the court said you cannot draw a district based entirely on uh, race. Now race can be a component, but it can't be the only component. And this is the famous uh, I-95 uh, uh, district uh, that was drawn by the North Carolina legislature, which went down basically I-95 in the eastern part of the state and picked up as many black voting areas uh, as, as they could in order to create a majority black district. The court said, you know, that's laudable that you want to make sure that everybody is represented, but you can't do it in this manner. <coughs> so... We know now that the types of remedies courts impose go beyond what the courts have imposed in the past. Now, in the past, remedies were straightforward. The loser paid, uh, the winner in one way or, or, or the other. But now, because the remedies often apply to large groups and can affect large numbers of people, the, the whole focus and the whole outcomes have changed. So I'll give you two examples. 
a federal judge heard a case brought by a prison inmate regarding bad prison conditions. The judge did not merely improve the person's condition or even the prison's overall conditions, but instead ordered the revamping of an entire state prison system at a cost to the state of more than $40 million. A federal judge heard a case involving the denial of welfare benefits to an individual. The judge not only ordered that he receive the benefits, but that an additional 100,000 receive them as well. Um, this, of course, goes into the, the area, have judges become um, too active, uh, judicial restraint versus judicial activism. Uh, the same thing is happening here in California. The federal courts have ordered the state to build a number of hospitals which are dedicated only for or only to uh, deal with those that we house or we incarcerate within the state. You and I, as a free citizen, cannot walk up and get... Um, get treatment. I'm not sure that I would want to anyways uh, in a, in a you know, work in a building in which um, people who are incarcerated uh, are being taken to for medical treatment. It's just, for me, way too dangerous. Now, what is the jurisdiction of a federal court? Well, there are four types. <coughs> Exclusive, concurrent, original, and, and appellate. Exclusive means the sole authority of a federal court to try a case. Concurrent means the authority of a court to try a case. Authority, original, excuse me, means authority of a court to hear a subsequent appeal. And appellate also means the authority of a court to hear a subsequent appeal. Now, what is the jurisdiction of the federal court? Well, the, the federal court... Um, is established <clears throat> and may try cases if it involves any number of these bullets um, the Constitution a federal law a treaty uh, Admiralty or maritime law and what that means let's say you're you are a, a deep-sea diver and you run across off the coast of Florida you run across a Spanish galleon with um, with booty uh, with you know gold and silver um, and the, it then becomes a, a case of who actually owns that in the uh, maritime law, um, uh, then it begins to take effect. Any dispute between two states, or two, two or more states, goes directly to the federal courts. So, for instance, California and Nevada fighting over Lake Tahoe and, um, and the development around the lake uh, wound up settling the uh, dispute in federal court. If the U.S. government is a party to a case, it goes to the federal courts. If a citizen from California sues a citizen from Nevada, it also goes to federal courts because it would give one or the other an advantage if you tried it in the state courts. Any case involving an ambassador or a diplomat goes to the federal courts. And any state which is sued or is party to a suit also has that case go to the federal courts. Now, we have a dual system of courts. Um, there are um, it, the federal courts, but we also have uh, what's known as state courts. Now, you know about them. You see the building sitting over here on Avenue M, the Antonovich Courthouse. Uh, in there are the uh, offices of the municipal court, um, which are basically those that exist for L.A. County. Um, there are other things that go on there. But in essence, if you want to visit a federal court, you have to go to downtown Los Angeles. So that means if you ever get called for jury duty uh, on a federal case, you have to travel down there every day rather than go to your local court, which, uh, which you would have to go to if you were called uh, for jury duty by the municipal system. <clears throat> now, uh, also... On that previous slide, there is a, um, a state Supreme Court. There is a state appellate court. Um, there are state district courts where you file. Um, when a case finishes the California Supreme Court and you want, like, like with the, the Gay Marriage Act, uh, if that, uh, once that goes through the, um, the state Supreme Court, which it did, and the state Supreme Court ruled it as unconstitutional, it then goes into the federal system. Now, there's two types of federal courts. Um, 
One is what we call Article I courts. Now, these are legislative or special courts that are mentioned in the Constitution, which that means they're enumerated. And that also means that judges uh, uh, have fixed terms, which means that they're not life terms. Uh, they, um, they serve in either a claims court, uh, which hears lawsuits against the federal government, or a court of military appeals, or the District of Columbia courts. Now, Article Three courts are the ones we're more familiar with and the ones we'll be talking about uh, more than anything else. <coughs> now, these are constitutional courts. Um, Article Three only created the Supreme Court, but it also gave the, the legislative branch the power to create inferior courts, which it did with, a legis with the Judiciary Act of 1789. The judges uh, in, the f in the federal system, these Article Three or constitutional courts, serve life terms. And there's now, because of the Judiciary Act of 1789, three levels of constitutional courts. If we look at this as a pyramid, the district courts are at the bottom. There's 91 of them. There are 12 courts of appeal, or what's known as circuit courts, and then there's one supreme court at the very top of that pyramid. Now, in this, uh, this week, we'll also be looking at uh, why our court system wound up like this, and especially why judges uh, have life terms, because we'll be looking at Federalist number 78 and studying it. Now, the structure of the federal court system, if you look at the district courts, like I just said, there's 91 district courts. There's approximately 610 judges. There are vacancies on the district courts uh, at, at any time for a number of reasons. Uh, retirement, uh, death, um, resignation on occasion. And because of Senate holds and things, uh, not all of the um, the open uh, judicial seats have been filled. So at any one time, there are a number of vacancies. Now, federal courts have judges and juries, just like the municipal courts here in California. And in addition to that, there's also what's known as a grand jury. And a grand jury uh, is called together to look uh, into a problem or into an issue. And if they find that uh, there is enough evidence to issue an indictment, that's what they do. Now, an, invite, an indictment is a charge um, that an individual... Uh, charge an individual because they feel that there's enough evidence... Uh, for that individual to be charged. Now, it does not mean that that individual is guilty. It merely means that one will be tried. Now, there's a jury of 12. It's a pettit or what's known as a trial jury, which will decide the outcome. Now, once that person is brought in, they go see a magistrate judge. And that magistrate judge will look at a number of things. They are the ones who will issue a warrant for, so the police can do whatever they need to do. They hold preliminary hearings to see if there is enough evidence to hold that person. And if there is, they also decide on uh, bail, if, it, if it's going to happen at all. It, uh, it happens in the magistrate's court. Now, they may try uh, civil, criminal, or constitutional cases in the district courts. Their decisions may be appealed to the circuit courts, or what's known as the Court of Appeals. And there is one problem with the uh, district courts, and that has been the, the turnover, um, the frustration of getting on the federal bench in the first place, and then the fact that um, pay has not kept up with either inflation or with the pay that the very best in the, uh, in the legal community are receiving as um, attorneys who work for law firms. Many have decided that it's just, despite the fact that it's very prestigious to be a federal judge, um, financially, it just doesn't pay. So many of them leave, which is what I mean by uh, re resignation to go back to go back into private practice. Now, the courts of appeal <coughs> are what's known as the circuit courts. Um, uh, are um, men and women who uh, a total of about about 156 judges. They try about 18,000 cases a year. They are usually tried. By, uh, by a panel of three judges who do work, um, because there's only 12 districts, they do work uh, 
throughout that district when they do have to meet and that uh, all together and that's called in bonk uh, they um, meet in San Francisco because California is part of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals which is the most liberal of the um, the circuit courts or the courts of appeal now any case that is tried and decided by the courts of appeal uh, and the courts of appeal have uh, appellate jurisdiction, those can then be heard by the Supreme Court. They can be appealed to the Supreme Court. So the, the uh, circuit courts hear appeals from the district courts. They hear appeals from the regulatory commissions like the SEC and the FCC. And um, those, ju those decisions made by the circuit courts can be upheld by the Supreme Court without comment uh, or the Supreme Court can decide that they're going to hear the case. And, and uh, for, for a lucky few cases, that is what happens. Now, we'll cover the um, Supreme Court a little bit later. But we need to look at the factors affecting the selection of federal judges. First and foremost, of course, <coughs> is senatorial courtesy. When appointing a district court judge, the president must consult with the two senators from the state in which they are to be appointed. It's courtesy. And the president doesn't want to create a a, uh, a mountain where one doesn't need to be. So the president usually follows this scenario. And um, once the senators have been informed, and sometimes they will say, you know, Mr. President, that's a really bad choice. I'm going to put a hold on the nomination. But let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say, let's say the, the senator agrees that you know, it's, a, it's a good nomination. It then goes to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Now, the Senate Judiciary Committee screens the nominees and sends a recommendation to the Senate floor for approval or rejection. Now, in the past, the, um, the uh, Judiciary Committee has relied heavily on the recommendations from the ABA, the American Bar Association, and others. Um, presidents used to also do that, but the, that seems to be um, on the wane. So after, um, uh, after the president sends the nomination to the Senate, it's hoped by the president and by the, the president's party that the, um, that the, uh, the nomination will be, uh, the nomination's pathway will be rather smooth, but sometimes it, it, it isn't. We know that in the 1980s especially, um, there's been more scrutiny given to the appointments, particularly those of the Supreme Court level. We do know uh, what happened to Robert Bork, or what was known as the Bork hearings, uh, the Thomas Hightech lynch lynchings. If you go back to your, uh, your notes on um, the Imperial Congress or, the or, the, or your notes on the president's uh, nominations to uh, the court, you can, you can reread this. We won't discuss it here. Um, the committee itself, has held up the confirmation of many of Clinton's lower court, or did, held up the nomination of, of Clinton's lower court judges. They then did the same thing with Bush. And um, sometimes uh, in, in the Clinton years, the, uh, the, uh, one of the nominations sat there for 44 months. That is three years and, uh, and eight months. Uh, and so... Um, the use of the holds by both parties does hold up and creates the vacancies that I was talking about when we were talking about the federal district courts. Now, in the Senate, the, uh, the Senate needs to um, vote with just a, a, a simple majority uh, for confirmation. Now, it has refused to act upon or has rejected about one out of five Supreme Court nominees this century. Um, we haven't had that happen since um, Bork in the uh, in the in the nineteen eighties. Um, the political parties generally look at judges as um, if they are from the the. <laughs> their party or the party of the the president and they're of the same party they're generally looked upon as as very promising but when you're the party out of power 
you you try to put the brakes on many of these nominees from becoming a member of the judici judiciary um, easily. You you use a lot of scrutiny. Now there are some issues: race and sex and age, which have which have come up. Race, um, we do know that that despite huge changes, uh, the judiciary is still mostly white. Um, Carter appointed more minorities than all the previous presidents combined. Clinton also appointed numerous minorities to the federal bench. There is what's known as a black seat on the Supreme Court, which was established by Thurgood Marshall. Uh, it is now, uh, at this point, being um, occupied by Clarence Thomas. And about 17% or one out of five of Clinton's appointments were black. Sex is also an issue because the judiciary is still mostly male. Uh, Carter appointed more women than all the previous presidents combined. About one out of four of Clinton's appointments were, were women. There used to be what was called a woman's seat on the court that was um, occupied by Sandra Day O'Connor, but with three women on the court at this point, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan, um, I don't think you can say that there's a women's seat anymore, and I think there's probably, at least at the Supreme Court level, a... Um, sex has become less less and less of an issue. Now, age is also an issue because, remember, justices are appointed for life. And justices, um, because that occurs, presidents want to be very careful. And this also has to do with the etiology. They know that any judge that they appoint to the system, if that judge decides to, you know, they're going to retire on the bench, they're going to they're gonna be on the bench long after the president who appointed them is in office. A president may be dead, who appointed them may be dead, and they'll still be on the bench. So it's important in the etiology that presidents, for the pre from the president's perspective, that the presidents generally try to appoint judges who represent their, uh, who represent a similar philosophy as the president. Now, we know that this is very difficult to ensure because, number one, Predicting future behavior um, is very difficult. New issues arise, which the president could not have even possibly uh, considered. Um, since ju justices have uh, have life terms, presidents can you do nothing about the decisions that they don't like. And we know that about one out of four judges move across the political spectrum and become someone that the president doesn't like. So, for instance, George H.W. Bush nominated David Souter, who turned out to be part of the liberal bloc for the last 15 or 16 years of his, of his Supreme Courtship, maybe 10, probably closer to 10. On the other hand, John F. Kennedy nominated Byron Wizard White, who was a football star at Colorado, I believe. And White, who Kennedy thought was liberal, moved over and became part of the conservative bloc once he got on the court. So um, presidents can't, you know, can be very, very frustrated by, uh, by the issues that, uh, that they can't control. And, and there's one other thing that's kind of interesting in, in this too. Um, ideology can also affect the decision of a judge to retire. So a judge may want to delay retiring until there's a president with a more favorable with a more favorable philosophy that then enables him to retire. Judge uh, Justice Stevens did that um, when he was assured that um, uh, President Obama would be the president and a liberal would replace a liberal. Then he felt comfortable retiring, and he was replaced by Elena Kagan. Now the American Bar Association evaluates the nominees. Now this. Um, and they sent that nomination to, to the Senate Judiciary Committee and to the White House. Um, the ABA nom uh, evaluations were not used by Bush, but the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee still considers them rather important. Now, another thing that affects the fact, another factor that affects the selection of federal judges is the existence of a paper trail. If a prospective judge like Robert Bork has written extensively, uh, his or her writings may be used against him or her during confirmation hearings. Bork's railing against um, Roe v. Wade essentially did him in, especially with a liberal Senate uh, that uh, 
that the Senate was in 1983. Um, so that may change the way um, a president looks at certain people. So Bush did not want to undergo a confirma confirmation hearing battle with the nominee who had an extensive paper trail. So he played it safe by nominating David Souter, who was a relative unknown sitting on the Vermont Supreme Court, I believe. And he was therefore dubbed the stealth candidate. And Bush was happy in the first couple of years, but after that, um, Souter began to move to the left. And um, it was a, a nomination that essentially backfired for Bush. Now, the number of judges can also be um, manipulated by Congress. They can increase the number of judges, they can decrease the number of federal judges, and the number of courts. If it has a president of the same party, it would be more likely to increase the number of uh, judgeships. Um, if it's a president of the, the opposing party, it would be um, it would be probably the other way. Um, because it, if there was a very undesirable president from their perspective sitting in the White House, it could reduce the number of judges by not allowing vacancies to be filled by judges who retired or died, and therefore slowly um, making the federal judiciary smaller. There's two more people I just want to look at. Um, the head of the Justice Department is called the Attorney General of the United States. He, he or she is appointed by the president with Senate consent, and again, they head the Justice Department. Uh, that current one is Eric Holder. The Solicitor General is the one before that. The Solicitor General is also appointed by the president with Senate consent. Uh, they represent the U.S. government and the Supreme Court. So if the U.S. government is a party to this case, they argue on behalf of the government. So this has to be a very talented man or woman. Elena Kagan was the, um, was the Solicitor General in the first couple of years of the Obama administration. They also decide which cases the federal government will appeal to the Supreme Court. And they also decide the federal government's positions in these cases. So um, this is also a very powerful position. They work much closer with probably with the White House than they do with the uh, Department of Justice. Now, the U.S. attorneys, these are also um, appointed by the president, and they have to be uh, appointed, uh, or they have to be um, uh, confirmed by the Senate. There are um, 91 district courts. I say 94 right here because the history books or the government books are all over the place. But if you go to the um, the website for the federal courts, they say 91. At, the, at this time when I wrote this, it was 94, and I just didn't catch it. Um, the U.S. attorneys ahead had a staff of assistant U.S. attorneys. And what they do is they prosecute federal cases before the district courts and the courts of appeals. What is also prevalent is that most cases are settled by plea bargaining. So most of them never reach uh, the stage where they're argued before a judge and jury. Now, again, the, just, the U.S. attorneys represent the U.S. government in civil cases before these same courts. They're appointed by, president, by the president for four-year terms, so you can see the swing back and forth as to who sits in the U.S. Attorney's Office by, uh, by who is president. The assistant U.S. attorneys are appointed by the Attorney General to assist the U.S. attorneys. And they are the... Um, as they, when they come from there, they're, uh, they again go to the uh, Senate for confirmation. Now, federal judges, which we already know, are appointed by the president with Senate consent, um, are dealt with in a number of ways by uh, the legislative branch um, and the Constitution. Article 3 says they shall hold their offices during good behavior, which means for life, and, and they can be impeached and removed by Congress, which is very, very, very rare. I think the last one was in the 1990s. The compensation for federal judges is determined by Congress, uh, though compensation cannot be lowered during a judge's term of office. Um, the uh, uh, same thing goes for the federal attorneys. The compensation is determined by, by Congress because these are not civil service positions, but they are nominated positions. Um, 
it, in 2000, the district court salaries were 155,000 a year. Uh, the Court of Appeals, $164,000 a year. The Supreme Court, $184,000 a year. And the Chief Justice, was $192,006. You can see that many of these people can make much, much more in private practice, which is why many of them ultimately leave the bench. Okay, that is.